All right, GM, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Ezekiel. Thanks for inviting me. How are you? I'm doing excellent. It's a little rainy here in uh, Los Angeles, so. Okay. Yeah, drove down, the road's a little bit slick, but we made it here one piece, so. Excellent. Yeah, like I said before, it's minus one here outside, so it's great to be in here. Same and the thing. snowstorm already passed and everything too? The, sorry, the snow? The snowstorm that you're in. Yes, that was very bizarre. That snow, that what, complete whiteout for two days and two nights. It got about knee high in snow. And then it rained and the snow went away. So now we're knee high in sludge and mud. But uh, the snow is going to come back, I hear. Let's see what mm. happens. The, um, the weather's been very strange, global warming and all of that. So let's see what happens. Of course. So my first question along the lines of mysticism and meditation is going to be, how has your meditation practice evolved over time from being a novice to where you're at right now? Sure. Ooh, that's a very good question. Oh, you've even written it down there. <laughs> okay. In the beginning, in the beginning, when you start to meditate, you will have all sorts of ideas of what you should meditate on. Some people meditate on breath. Some people meditate on chakras. Some people meditate on the Dantian. Some people, but, but all of this meditation is designed to go inwards and focus inwardly and explore the self, explore your thoughts, your feelings, what you think to create the feelings you have, what the feel, what thoughts, the feelings are creating. And you watch all of this going on on the inside. So you're basically at that point, you are meditating on your first idea of what self is. When you do this kind of meditation for your average person, focusing on anything and relaxing is a great exercise. Absolutely. It, it's relative to your objectives in life. So to focus on something to the point where all of your daily problems are not in your focus means that your brain can relax, your heart can relax, you relax inside, and then you can go back into your normal everyday life with a relaxed attitude and of course the stress and anxiety builds up again inside you and you go back and you do the meditation again five minutes does wonders half an hour does even better wonders if you can do it for an hour at a time great but generally it can happen quite quickly the calmness and that's where i began then you can expand your meditation to watching yourself walking, watching yourself working, watching yourself wash the dishes, watching what you say, watching why you say what you say. That's, that's expanding your focus to um, the external world. That's the next stage. So that was the next stage for me. Then after, let's say, 10, 20 years, hopefully you have the realization that all of this self that you've been watching is relative and you create relative truths from watching this self. And by that, I mean what you think and why you think it and what you believe and why you believe it. These become relative truths to you. However, once your brain dies and you die or your body dies those relative truths die with it that's why there are any relative truths absolute truth is a whole different animal so obviously there are two kind of truths relative truth and absolute truth so after quite some time you'll have the realization that what you are meditating on what you are watching is something other than that part of you that is doing the watching in the first place. Now I need to explain that just a little bit. <clears throat> Most people, when they are seriously meditating to find the real self, you 
negate all of the things you are aware of, you realize you are not your thoughts, you are not your feelings, you are not your body, you are not male or female. These are just things you identify with. You, you, you are not American or, or Bulgarian or Australian. You're none of these things. You negate all of these concepts and eventually you get to a point where you realize that you are nothing. That doesn't mean you're not there. When I say nothing, you are a no thing. Now, nothing is a thing. <laughs> Stay with me here. If there wasn't nothing, there would be nowhere to put everything. So nothing is there, obviously, and that's what you get to. When most people get to that point, they become very scared because they've dropped everything that they are comfortable with as identity. So they get scared and they fill this emptiness back up with thoughts of self and beliefs to make themselves comfortable again and to be able to function in the everyday world. So what I'm getting at is once you realize you are this and no thing, this pure, pristine, clean emptiness that is aware of all things, you then have to start exploring self again, but you start exploring that self, the no self. And in that no self, it is unlimited. It's not limited by time. It's not limited by the restrictions of the physics of matter. Um, it's not limited by psychology. It is immortal, it's timeless, and it is absolutely saturated with love and awareness. So now, once you get to that point, you have the liberty of exploring timelessness and immortality and universal love and all the other mysteries that make up what we call being alive. That's what I meditate on now. And to be honest, I haven't found anything beyond that to meditate on. It's not really a meditation because you're not watching it at that point. You are being it. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so I have two questions within that are like observations and notes. But um, when he talks about being in a passive state and then going to more of an active say, state of meditation where you're moving around and things like that, was it like, did you get so comfortable passively meditating that it was just easier to integrate it as you were moving around? Or is it just like you just threw yourself right into it while you're being active and moving around, you're just watching yourself. Like, did you have that watchfulness as you were active or did you have to like keep on practicing passively until you had enough, enough like watchfulness inside of you and then you finally took it into being active? Okay. There's actually a term for what you're speaking about and it's called stillness in action. It's something that martial artists strive towards as well. And it's a state of no response. When you see thoughts come up, here's an instance. In the beginning or not a bit further past the beginning, when you are in meditation and you're sitting in silence and your mind is settled and your breath is settled and your heart is settled and you're just in a wonderful state of um, relaxation, a little voice will come up and say, oh, this must be it. That wasn't you. That was your ego that said that, that was the thoughts. The trick there is not to respond to that. A, a little smile will come on your face, realizing that your ego is pretending to be you still, but you don't respond to it. It's called non-responsiveness. So if you practice that, you get better and better at being absolutely still on the inside but watching your thoughts produce movements in response to the external world. So you allow your thoughts to respond. You allow your thoughts to um, take you through the world of people and the world of matter, because that's what the brain does. That's what the ego does. And that's that really. I give you, for instance, while I'm speaking to you now, you're at moments you are nodding. Are you, are you aware that you are nodding? Are you aware that your eyes are moving around occasionally? Are you aware that you just blinked three times? And again, 
uh, when you speak, are you aware that your hand comes up occasionally? You're smiling occasionally now while I'm talking to you. Are you watching that? Did you notice you just smiled now and it hasn't stopped? That's, that's real meditation. It's just watching what everything is doing like a baby sitting in a pram, just being absolutely fascinated by everything that goes by while it's being wheeled in the pram. You watch a baby and let, if the baby's fed and it's not hungry, it's just all eyes, it's just awareness, it's these things going by, it's these people going by, someone will stick their face in the pram and go, oh, good you, good you, and the baby will go out like that, but it's just watching, and there's no internal response at that point. So that's the difference. The It just can't, you don't try to be that way. If you meditate diligently without fail, if, if a day comes along and you just don't feel like meditating, you watch that. You watch the not wanting to do it, in which case at that point you're still meditating. There's a few noises coming through. Is that on your end? No. Let me mute myself and see. It's gone. It's okay. Yeah, yeah I'm at myself right um, Real meditation is constantly watching, constantly sitting down with your legs crossed in a funny situ in funny um, postures and what have you. There's reasons to be doing that, but it's not real deep meditation. Um, what that does is trains you to rely on going into a quiet place and relying on setting yourself up on a mat or a cushion and sitting in a lotus position. And there are many other positions that people go, go into. That, they are forms of meditation, but they are not. And I don't mean this derogatively to anyone at all that are doing these practices. It's not the deepest meditation. It's not the real meditation. The real meditation is to be pure awareness and meditate on everything that isn't that awareness, which is your body walking. There, there's a, a sect in, in Japan, very old, called Shinto. Most people have heard of Shinto. Um, and in that, you may see a Shinto monk walking down the streets of Japan and he'll ring a bell. He will have a hat where he can't see the people in front of him, but he can see the sidewalk. And he'll ring a bell and he'll sit there and listen to the bell until he can't hear it anymore. And then he will take a step. But in that step, he will feel the impetus to take the step. He will watch the hip flexors lifting up the thigh. You will watch the thigh muscle bring the bottom of your leg forward. You will watch the bottom of the leg go down. You will be aware of and feel the heel of his foot touching the sidewalk. You will feel the rest of his foot touch the sidewalk, each toe, and then he will ring the bell again. He will watch himself ring the bell, and then he'll watch the other leg come up and watch each muscle as it works in turn. And he watches that all day. It takes about six hours to get to the shop, which is about half a kilometer away. There's, uh, there are books in China, one in particular called Higher Martial Arts. In Higher Martial Arts, you be, when you are ready to throw a punch, you become aware of the impetus arriving in your brain, creating electrical impulses, and you will watch each muscle as your front deltoid picks up to move your arm forward and it'll watch your trapezius come into play and it'll watch your tricep moving forward and you watch each stage of that movement all the way up to the actual blow hopefully on a punching bag and not on the end of someone's nose that's higher martial arts. That's the kind of martial arts that is designed, or that is the practice that is designed to get you to that same place of pure awareness. That is where martial arts becomes your spiritual practice. So in all of these things and all of the meditations, if you understand it correctly, they are all, and it doesn't matter what culture you come from or what method you use, the method should always be designed 
to make you one with awareness. You're already one with your awareness, but to be purely coming from that space all the time. And then when you are coming from that space all the time, you've risen above the physical realm, although you are still in control and you are still very much an integral part of it. And you have risen above the limited part of your life, which is the physical part. And you are purely aware of and one with that part of you that is not physical, that is not limited by time, that is immortal. And that's the ending of meditation. At that point, you are meditating and you are a meditator and it doesn't stop. Didn't take me a week. It took me five six decades almost to get to that point and I don't know but that could be slow I'm not sure I'm sure there are people that have made it in much quicker time than I so that's meditation I hope that made sense it's been a long day <laughs> oh, that made sense <laughs> uh, and then you mentioned also the no self as well uh, personally like I ran into a certain teaching that I follow that that uh, talks about the no self like that. And I think what you mentioned also earlier, because I said I had like two questions. Um, you mentioned about like when you go into the no self and just in a state of pure awareness and people get scared, you know, of being in a state of nothingness. To me, that sounds like going through the dark night of the soul where I guess it's almost like a factory reset on your, on your being. So like, can you touch on like that moment and I guess this goes to another question I have right here. Does meditation require courage? Yes, to a point. However, let's look at that word courage. You have to be scared to be courageous. If you're doing something that doesn't scare you, it doesn't require courage. You, you see what I mean? Courage is doing something even though it scares you. Courage is doing something that even though you don't want to do it, you still do it. That's what courage is. If you're scared of something, but you still do it, that's courageous. If you're doing something that you're not scared of at all, then that doesn't take courage. So for some people who don't care, and I don't mean that in a negative way, people that don't care that they've reached um emptiness people who emptiness reaching that point of awareness reaching enlightenment if that means more to you than death or means more to you than um pain or suffering or any of that if none of that means anything to you if the only thing that means anything to you is reaching enlightenment or the enlightened state then it doesn't take courage that that um that need that is in you to do that will override all of those things if you are a more timid kind of person and becoming nothing becoming emptiness becoming unimportant and all of these things and when i say unimportant i mean conceptually unimportant all life is important but if you're the kind of person who wants to be more important than the person next door or more important than anyone or anything, if you're slightly narcissistic, then becoming nothing is extremely an extremely fearsome thing for those people. And if they are to go the next step, it, it's called jumping off the edge of the cliff in, in the Zen Palais. A lot of people reach the edge of the cliff and then they come back. So if you are um, one of those people, if you have narcissism in you, if you have a need to be special in the eyes of others, then reaching that nothingness will scare the bejesus out of you. Probably wrong wording will scare the hell out of you. Um, and if you're going to take that next step into that void, then that will take great courage. So it depends on the nature of the person. Did yeah, I like, answer that? Yeah, you did. Like the way that I've experienced it, like I've had like visionary experiences myself or like dream experiences myself when I uh, 
started to enter into that no self state. Like I would see a void or like the floor would open up and then I would like find myself on the seat falling. And then I, sometimes I would just be like, no, I can't do this. And then to close out the experience. And then there's been times where I haven't gone full through yet actually. But <laughs> when I almost went all the way through though, I remember I uh, had this experience where the start of it happened to where I was, uh, I was, I fell asleep and everything was pitch black. And then I thought I woke up, but everything was still dark. So I was like, am I dreaming right now? Like what's happening? And then like this door opened up. And then as soon as like this door opened up in this pitch black room, like I could feel it open up. I started to fall right down into it. And then I found myself endlessly falling. And then as soon as I accepted that I was going to fall forever, I then started to go through like this wormhole and I was just like traveling through like this blue, purpley, purplish color. And then I was hearing voices at the same time too, telling me to like, you're going crazy. You know, you're going to lose your mind. You should go to like a mental institution. And it was my, it was a, it was the voices of my brothers and sisters too, which is the most trippiest thing ever. Cause I, I legit thought like I was having a schizophrenic episode, but it was just like my ego, like fighting to cling to, you know, or fighting to stay there. So, but I listened to those voices and then the wormhole shut off and then, you know, it ended like that, but it required, at least for me, that it required courage to like step, take a step into that unknown. Wonderful. That's brilliant, actually. This is going to sound silly. No, I won't say that. <laughs> the point there, and Buddha talks about this, many, many great meditators of the past talk about that point that you're talking about now. The Buddha uh, referred to it as um, something like 5,000 demons. For all the Buddhists out there, I might have got those numbers wrong, so I apologize. But there's a point where Buddha was under the tree meditating and a thousand demonic soldiers came over the hill and they all lit up their arrows and they all fired arrows towards the Buddha. But the Buddha refused to move. He just sat there in his meditation and just watched it. And as the arrows arrived, they all turned into flower petals and just landed around him. Not the same pictures that you had, but exactly the same situation. The point is, don't respond. It's like I said before, when you're sitting there and your heart and your mind has settled and this little voice comes up and you go, this must be it. That wasn't you. Don't respond to that. Just listen to that, th that voice and let it go. As you get further and further away from the ego self, it will throw more and more things at you. You will get itches. Suddenly your nose will itch at, at the crucial moment in your meditation, or you will feel like your bowels are going to move. These are what symbolically are called demons coming at you to try and get you to move. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter what gets thrown at you. It doesn't matter what you see or feel. The trick is don't respond, don't move. Watch the wormhole, watch the colors, don't get involved in them, don't uh, be moved by them, just be still and it will all clear away and what comes next will astound you if you can just sit through that. That takes courage, but at the end of it, you'll realize that you didn't need courage, that you just had to have faith in your real self. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so when you're in the Himalayas, I, I remember one of your interviews, you mentioned like spiritual survival, like you, you learned a lot about spiritual survival up there. So like for you, like what did you learn about spiritual survival when you're in the Himalayas? Spiritual survival is pretty much everything I just said. Now, when the, there was a time when I was at a meeting in 1985 at a place called Chok Hong Monastery in Lhasa, 
at that time there were riots in the streets and the Chinese soldiers were in there beating people and killing people etc um, and there was one point where they were throwing monks off the roofs there was monks from all different monasteries and temples it was a, a big meeting it's one of the major monasteries in Tibet it's in Lhasa which is the, the capital city there and these monks uh, sorry, these soldiers were, a lot of them were dressed up as Tibetan policemen, but they weren't in reality. And they came into our monastery and they started beating monks and uh, quite a few monks were killed. Nine monks from my particular monastery was killed. Three of us survived. Luckily for me, one of them was my teacher. There was one point where they put a noose around my neck on the roof and uh, so another soldier was tying off the noose to a rafter and the two guys that had me threw me off the roof but the guy tying the knot didn't have time to tie the knot correctly and it came loose and I, I hit the ground below so it was quite a traumatic time and then if that wasn't enough uh, we were taken and we were tortured for about a week with cigarette burns and beatings and all of that kind of you may have noticed all my fingers when i try to do this they're all quite broken they were snapped one at a time and that was all to get me to renounce my faith in the dalai lama and um, throw in my robes etc they had strange ways of doing things so we were saved eventually and i had to i went to australia to convalesce and i took my teacher at the time with me and he said you know if you and i'd been there for about 18 years at that point and he said if you have any remorseful thoughts if you have any revengeful thoughts or hatred towards what the people that have done this to us your whole time as a tibetan monk has been for nothing and you need to protect your spirit you need to protect what you've done and for the good of all the people that you may talk to in the future years um and i saw what he meant and i i saw that the people that were doing these things was only doing that because of the way they were programmed uh, their culture their beliefs is why they did these things some people some of them was doing it purely out of fear of what would happen to them if they didn't follow orders and their thoughts were the same as anyone else's thoughts. They drive you. If you think you are your thoughts, if you think you are your programs, they will make you do horrible things or very good things, depending on what those thoughts are. So at that, I finished convalescing and I went to China and joined a monastery in China for five years at a place called um, Leifa Mountain. The monastery was called Dao Wu Xin, which means the way of no mind or the way of no ego, the way of no center, basically. And it was at a place called Leifar Mountain, which is a very considered a very mysterious mountain in those parts. And that is in the um, southwest of Beijing in the Hunan province over there. Anyone in China listening to this will know where I'm talking about. So I went there and um, the monks there were no different to the monks I'd been with in Tibet. Once you get past your ego, once you get past your programs, everyone shares the same loving, caring, compassionate mind. And that, that is protecting the spirit, not responding to the world of men and women when they're being nasty understanding is the best way to protect spirit and never ever let go of the love that comes from that part of your mind or your heart i should say 100 percent. and I, so this kind of like a little bit off of what we're talking about but good <laughs> what is the difference between the astral plane and the dream world and like to expand on that, like there are some nights to where I feel like I go out of body and there's some nights where I just feel like I'm dreaming. And then there's some nights where I just can't tell what it is. So like, how do you kind of notice the difference between the two? 
Well, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they are all parts of the mysteries of life. And you, if you need to know it all, then you need to see it all and experience it all. They are all parts of the same mind. And I don't mean your mind or my mind. I mean the mind, the universal mind. The astral realm is what the Kabbalists call Yesod, which is uh, uh, I'm tempted to say the spiritual realm, but the spiritual realm covers everything. When you close your eyes and you visualize, you are looking, you are seeing in the astral, on the lower half of the astral realm. You are seeing that area where knowing turns into thought, pictures. The astral realm can also is also known as uh, the uh, Akashic realm. The Akashic realm is where all of the experiences and all of the knowledge of everyone and everything that has lived, its information goes and is collected in that realm. It's like a library when you dream lucid dreaming you are in the astral realm when you can separate your consciousness from your brain your physical body and you can move around your house or out of your house or anywhere else you are in your astral body at that point and you have to remember this as well when you leave your body when you astral journey, you don't take your brain with you that stays in the body. And therefore, all the thoughts and concepts that are in that brain stays in the body. So in the astral realm, you move around purely from knowing. You know where to go, you know how to be, you know what you're doing, but you're not thinking it. And you are experiencing the knowing that the brain turns into thought. So it's a realm of knowing. It's a difficult one to put into words because we're talking about a realm that is outside of thought and outside of words. It's like pure love. You can't talk about it. I think we've had this discussion before. If you ask someone, do you love your mother? And that person goes, yes, of course I love my mother. If you were to say, how do you know you love your mother? If they're honest, they will say, I just know when you know you love someone you don't have to think about it your love isn't based on knowledge it's not based on thoughts it's not based on anything you just know when you love someone and that love is coming from the astral which is the residence of spirit but not just your spirit or my spirit spirit in general mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the astral and it's not just on this plane when we speak of these things you, you we, we can't just be talking about this earth this planet it's everywhere throughout the cosmos it's it's a dimension yeah and then going into like qigong and stuff um of question what is the microcosmic orbit Oh, it's an exercise. It's a nice one, actually. Do you want me to go through it for you? Please. Okay. It, it has everything to do with chi. However, if you're not that interested in chi, it's a good meditation to become more aware of your internal processes. So the whole point is to keep your back straight, keep your torso straight. And you breathe into your Dantian. Now I'm going to digress just a little bit and here. Yeah, what is the Dantian real quick? Okay. Dantian is an area just below your belly button. So between your pubic bone and your belly button, when you breathe deeply into that, it will bulge. And that's where your chi resides. Whenever you're finished with your chi, if you are a qigong practitioner, you always gesture and put the chi back into that place. When you are doing your qigong breathing, you're breathing into that place, into your dantian. Now, the microcosmic orbit is where 
you will breathe deeply into that area, keeping in mind that chi, keeping in mind, keeping in mind that chi follows mind. I'm going to digress for one minute here. If you're the kind of person that doesn't do any chi work whatsoever, and you are pensive, if you're the kind of person that is constantly in your head thinking, 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 your chi will go there. And of course, if you don't have any knowledge of this stuff, you won't bother putting it away at the end of the day. You will go to bed thinking, thinking, thinking. And that chi will go stale in your head. And eventually you will end up with mental illness, brain illnesses, disease of that nature. Could be anything from brain cancer to um, psych psycho, I don't know how to, how I should put this psychological problems let's say if you're the kind of person that's constantly thinking about sex constantly thinking about sex 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 that's all you talk about that's all you think about your chi will go there because that's where your mind is at and once again if you don't know to put that away and to put it back into your dantian it will go stale and you'll end up with all kinds of genital problems from erectile dysfunction to testicular cancer and a whole heap of other horrible things in between. What I'm sort of getting at there is chi follows mind and therefore you need to put your chi back where it belongs at the end of the day. It's like an electric drill. Once you've finished drilling holes in a wall, you don't walk around with this drill all day long because you're going to poke someone's eye out with it. You need to put that away when you're finished with it. Every and any tool is that same thing. Now, put that aside for a sec. Microcosmic orbit. When you're sitting there, you've done your chi breathing, you've filled your dantian, you've warmed up. You visualize and you visualize because chi will follow your mind. So the pressure of your inner internal breath, you breathe in, down into your dantian, and you visualize that pressure pushing your chi up your spine as you breathe in. So you breathe in, you visualize the chi moving up your spine, across the top of your head, inside, not across the top of the skin, but inside your skull. And when you feel it getting to this point, you relax and breathe out, and your chi will start to fall back down to the dantian pass here your pituitary gland down past your nasal cavity down through your behind your throat behind your adam's apple behind your chest past your heart back down into that area and as you feel it arrive at the bottom of your dantian you take another breath and push it back up then you breathe out and allow it to fall down the front that's the microcosmic orbit it's going around your body now, eventually, and what that does is it, it clears out all kinds of what we call ganglia. Some people would call them chakras, but these are nerve centers that are all over your body and they are there to take care of things that you don't need to be thinking about, like your heart, breath, uh, your heart beating and your lungs breathing on their own. That's taken care of by these little ganglia they're like little brains we have them all over our body taking care of things so your chi will move through those and clear them out and re-energize them many of them seize up by the time you're a young teenager for many reasons and this is meant to clean those out so that's a microcosmic orbit it's an ability to move your chi around your body through all of the important areas if you can do that for five minutes, it will make you feel very good. If you can do that for 20 minutes, your focus will start to become very strong because you're focused on this thing. Um, if you can do it for an hour, you will start to feel some fantastic benefits because you are taking control of a bodily function consciously. And that's a microcosmic orbit. It's a Qigong mm. exercise. Yeah, like uh, so I see it with some people too. They raise their eyebrows. Like, is there any like maybe raising your eyebrows or squeezing your pelvic muscles or anything like that involved? Does it just breathe in and then like, like it just mm -hmm. 
it's just a pressure thing the trick the only thing you need to realize is um it's like driving a um we call it a manual car where you actually change the gears yourself rather than an automatic motor car when you have a manual car you need to be able to synchronize your accelerator with the clutch if they're not in sync if you can't do it in absolute synchronization your car will go that and that and that and that because you've dropped it too fast and it's just not working for you so in the same way to get that nice smooth synchronization it takes a little bit of practice and then your car will just take off nice and smoothly so with your breathing the point is to have no break in that circulation in the orbit so you breathe in pressurize feel the chi coming over the top as it starts to fall you breathe out as it comes down to your dantian you breathe in and it's to get that wonderful smooth rotation that smooth orbit as you get more if you want to go deeper into qigong practices there you then go on to what's called hugging the tree exercise which is where you will stand in a horse stance any martial artist will know what i mean by that and you go into uh, a posture which represents hugging a big tree and then you get another orbit you get this orbit to go around this way from one hand where are we there from one hand jumping the gap into the other hand and then all the way around and that is also um circulated with your breathing that's a bit more advanced Mm -hmm. and of course there's hundreds depending on what your tradition is and what martial art family you come from and what sect of Taoism you go to there are different ways of doing these exercises yeah and then speaking of stance can you define what sinking force is and how do you develop it what sorry can you define what sinking force is and how do you develop it well i can only tell you my version of that have you ever seen the demonstration where you might have a, um, a 15 stone man and he might have a um, i don't know a, i'll have to do it in kilos i'm sorry i can't, <laughs> I can't do it in your language yes yeah, so you, you might have a, a 95 kilo guy and a 45 kilo woman in front of him and he can just grab her and throw her up into the air not a problem at all but then as she sinks and grounds herself suddenly he can't move her she will not lift he doesn't matter how much he tries he can't pick her up that's sinking everything into the ground that's lowering some people will belittle it by saying oh that's lowering your center of gravity but it's a bit more than that it's pressing yourself into the ground and rooting yourself into the earth to the point where you are almost as heavy as the earth and it doesn't require any visualization it requires sinking it requires if this is what you mean um you can begin that by working on what's called the inner smile and the inner smile is where you let your upper diaphragm sink in the middle by purely relaxing it and then your next diaphragm in your body there's a di there's three diaphragms but there's one across your pelvis which stops your guts from falling into your pelvic area there's another diaphragm here which we're all aware of um, and the idea is to ra relax internally so that they if you could see those diaphragms they would look like they're smiling this is the real meaning of the internal smile but to do that you need to feel gravity you need to give give in to gravity feel that coming down and getting heavier and heavier and sinking your heels into the earth that's all i can say on that if that's what you meant that's what i meant yeah okay so that's uh, these these are quite easy really and unless you have a complicated mind and if you're the sort of person that's going oh what does that mean what's that symbolic of what, what what would that mean you know i need to look through the mayan books 
that's you don't need any of that it's exactly how it sounds drop your mm. gravity relax internally breathe into your heels and sink in but you need to take your shoes off for this as you know i deal with a lot of depressed people unfortunately um and a great many of people are starting to worry about their children becoming depressed and one of the biggest things of today's children becoming depressed is they have been so isolated from the planet that produces your body for you by wearing nothing wearing shoes all day long walking on concrete staring at a four-inch screen all day long swiping swiping they completely and then when they look up for a few moments what do they see concrete buildings concrete buildings cars bitumen and this is what's depressing these kids it's not what they're thinking it's because they're absolutely isolated and detached from the earth and what i found and it's not a dis discovery of mine it's something that i was taught as well if you can get these kids to take their shoes and socks off and just walk on the grass for half an hour and go to the beach and feel the sand between their toes or just have them paddle in the waves and you know just ankle deep and walk through the water and have some trees around them and point out the birds in the trees and the woodpeckers pecking holes and things these kids they shrug off their depression within hours it's incredible what happens I yeah, we're on to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, lovely. We can talk about mental health a little bit. So, like in one of your interviews, you talked about how in your clinic you can put your own energy into people, as well as like take control of their willpower if they allow you to, to help better their mental health. So, like, can you share an example of like when you did this? An example of when I did this, or how yeah. I did. Uh, when you did it. There was one person, I'm not going to mention names. There was one person, it was a woman. She wasn't too old, wasn't too young, maybe mid forties. And she was having heart problems. And she'd seen many doctors, she'd seen neurologists, and it all came down to eventually they told her that they was going to have to do some operating on her. And of course, once they told her this, the heart problems got worse because she was now terrified for all the obvious reasons. I'm going to have to go into, unfortunately, the placebo effect and psychology. See, these all come into it and energies. So for her, it was a matter of me getting her complete trust it was a matter of her understanding that what i do although has the same outcome of many medical practices i'm coming more from a monk's viewpoint or a mystic's viewpoint on how things work i need to digress again just for a moment Science is the absolute pinnacle of our strategies and tools for uncovering truth. Scientists, however, are people. Science is a wonderful thing. It's irreproachable. Scientists come at it with fear. They come at it with bias. They come at it with preset models that they refuse to let go of. When I say fear, scientists come at these things with the fear of being laughed at. For instance, most people already know this. If, uh, if as a young scientist, you discover something that is outside of a preset model and you pursue your discovery or your theory, you can be laughed out of your career. You will be shunned by other scientists. 
UFOs is a good example of that. Anyone dabbling into looking at UFOs up until several years ago would have probably lost their career and been belittled and laughed at and told that they're stupid. Of course, now everyone knows that they've been there forever and the governments have now come out and said, yes, they're there, but we, you know, we've never known what they are. That's why we hid it all from you, but it's become a reality. Grey Fox is a man who has been uncovering ancient civilizations for years and years. He's, he's got the evidence. He's got the proof. He's looking in. He's not a scientist actually. He's a, um, a journalist, but he's still, went this way and he's uncovered and got the evidence that we have been around for not 6,000 years but 20, 30, 40,000 years and some even say up to 100,000 years so there's evidence of civilizations on this earth that were there before the ice age. The evidence is there and more and more evidence is coming up as the ice caps are melting However, archaeologists still run him into the ground, but he has the courage to keep going, and I hope he does keep going. He's got great support from the everyday people. So what I'm getting at here is, when it comes to healing people, you can't just approach it scientifically. Real science is when you, <coughs> excuse me, you understand and realize that consciousness awareness mind and love are a big part of everything in life that is going on and these things have to be brought into our scientific explorations there's a few scientists have realized that for instance the double split experiment where if you look at a subatomic particle it's a solid particle but when you look away from it, from that particle, it becomes waveform. You look at it, it goes solid again. You look away from it, it becomes a waveform. These are subatomic particles. You and I and the entire universe is made of subatomic particles. So that would imply that everything that is solid, apparently solid matter at the moment, means that something is looking at it. It's up to you to decide what that something might be. I'm not going to go into that. So that's scientific fact. Now, getting back to healing people. <laughs> the woman that had the heart problem. It was a very simple. Do you trust me? Yes. Do you have faith in what I do? Yes. Is that a religious faith or just faith in what you have in me? from the time you've known me and how you feel about me. No, it's not religious faith. It's just that I know you and I feel quite good about you spiritually and mentally, and I trust what you're going to do. I've already half healed that woman just from her saying that to herself and to me. So now I would put my hand on the bottom, have her lay down on a bed. I put one hand on the bottom of her foot and say, can you feel anything coming from that hand? Now, whether she can or she can't, and I'm putting love in there, and I, I need to regress a little bit here. There are many ways to heal someone, but the way I was taught was, if I see someone suffering, let's hypothetically from cancer, and they are suffering and they are feeling pain, I would prefer to have their cancer than to see them suffering. That is enough to start healing someone that love, that's pure, unadulterated, universal love. So I put my hand on there. You explain this to people, of course, so they can get a picture of what you're talking about and what you're doing. So I put my hand there. Can you feel anything? Yes. Excellent. I put my hand on the knee. Can you feel anything there? Mm, just a moment. Yes, I'm feeling something. I don't ask what it is they're feeling. I went, great, that means something is going to happen. My next hand goes up over her heart and I place my hand on the heart. I say, now, can you feel that? And she will focus and she will start to feel and focus on what she believes is healing love from me. 
and that's all there is to it whatever the universe whatever life is doing to make that happen science will call that a placebo effect but from that within 24 hours this woman has healed herself she has never had palpitations she's never had chest pain since so she is healed so what i'm talking about here is as a mystic you understand the ability to create miracles in people and what i mean by that is it's no different to you going to a doctor and going oh, i've got this problem and it just won't go i can't get rid of it i've seen other doctors that they can't fix it this doctor will give you a sugar tablet you don't know it's a sugar tablet but if he's got you in the right state of mind he'll give you this tablet he'll say if you take this tablet tonight at exactly midnight 12 o'clock because that's when the body he'll give you some physiological reason that's when the body starts to close down and heal itself and you do deep breathing for three or four minutes after you've taken the tablet and lay in bed this is a hypothetical tomorrow when you wake up you'll be pretty much healed and the pain will be gone and you'll be fine he will create a placebo effect in you you will believe that the tablet has done its job and you will have created a miracle in yourself people go oh that's just placebo that's not real what it healed you you healed yourself what that's real it happened so placebo the word placebo needs to be exchange for the word miracle especially when it happens it's getting into hospitals now there is now such a thing as placebo surgery where they'll take you into surgery they'll cut you open they won't do anything they'll cut you open and then they'll sew you back up and the next day or 48 hours later the lump or whatever it has you had in there has disappeared your body has gotten rid of it by itself because you believed that you had been operated upon but you hadn't this is a fact this is happening now you can it's not even hidden it's it's there's documents written about this and this is how i heal people much of the time uh, all i need is to have their faith to let them know that i would prefer to take on their problems than to see them suffering and you, you you've been in a room and I'll explain this in a sec, what I was about to say. And that's all I need. And together we produce a miracle or a placebo effect. And that will cure everything and anything if you can make it happen from cancer to psychological problems. That's the placebo effect. Now, just one little piece that I would like to add to that when it comes to feeling someone out and having faith in someone in a completely different scenario how many people do you know and you yourself you walk into a room someone's home after they've had a severe domestic argument you haven't heard the argument you didn't know they were arguing you've walked into their home and you think well you could cut the atmosphere in here with a knife you're feeling something bad that happened you're feeling the anger you're feeling the angst that were in those people and in the same way when you really care about someone and you really love someone whether you know them or not they feel it and when they feel it miracles happen you can make miracles happen and that's the power of this is going to sound naff but that's the power of universal love the ability to work with that and use it as a tool and understand that not everyone would believe you if this is how you spoke about it sometimes you need to speak about it in scientific terms even if you have to use the word chi if they believe in chi but they don't believe in universal love you go okay i'm going to put some chi into you now and if they believe and have faith that you are a chi master boom you've just created that effect and you will heal them i'm not saying that chi itself won't work that way but this is how i do it i've completely forgot what you asked me but i enjoyed saying all of that <laughs> I, I can totally relate to that though um i mean the question is more along the the lines of mental health but either way, that can still apply to mental health. Because uh, like, 
Yeah, I've, I've spent like time healing people as well. Like I, I've, well, was a couple of years ago, but I put a lot of time into like giving my love to people. Um, I was more part of a Christian sect at the time. So it was like, we did, just how you described it, it was like that, you know, but we considered it the love of God was healing them, things like that. Um, but th the thing though that I would, with the placebo thing that you mentioned, I kind of saw it though as like, sometimes energy would, like a lot of energy would just come down and actually come down and heal a person. Whereas like, when I've seen it kind of be placebo, it kind of seemed like a, the person was closed off and then it took a while for the person to actually warm up. Like you had to do some work. There's times where like, I feel like a lot of like energy is present there and it's available for that person to get healed. And then there's times where like they're closed off. Like I would say it's just their ego shielding them from seeing that love or whatever. And so usually sometimes it doesn't even happen because there's this barrier. Of, mm -hmm. And there's times where actually sometimes that love will crack through their ego. And then they have a new experience, uh, whether it be Absolutely. a new one or like a realization of like a higher self so that, you know, but yeah, I think, yeah, the term placebo is very, uh, it's, it's kind of harmful. Um, it I is. think it's more just the fact that people have an e like a strong ego and they don't know how to let go of it and experience that bliss and that higher mind, uh, so that even if they don't get healed, they still have something even greater than that, so. Yeah, yeah. This is why I was saying the, the word placebo is, is not good. It's, it needs to be replaced with miracle or love. Um, like I said, also every, every culture has different ways of doing it. If you're in a Christian situation mm -hmm. and the person you're talking to has great belief in the Christian way, um, that will work as well it's, it's, as long as there's faith and love it, it can be done what the faith and love is it depends on the situation and the people you're talking to of course as a mystic i i'll jump from one to the other if you know if i'm working on a christian we'll refer to it as christ if we etc 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 when it comes to mental health, I have a, actually a completely different approach. Um, I've spoken about this many times. It, it, to me, there's many ways of doing it. Of course, if you're a psychiatrist, you'll be using uh, chemicals. You will give the person chemicals and say, oh, your serotonin is not working. So let's give you these or your uh, your uptake receptors aren't working properly, so they'll give you some other chemical. That's how they work on it. But that, of course, is a terrible way to be doing things when you're talking about mental health. Psychology will have you work with your thoughts and understand your thoughts um, and give you exercises to try and replace thoughts with better ones and try and keep you positive uh, and all of that. They have their ways of doing things. For me, it's purely a matter of showing you and taking, taking you away from your thoughts and watching your thoughts being ill. As soon as you do that to someone, there is an immediate effect. This isn't a belief of mine. I don't deal in belief. Belief is a complete opposite of a fact. A belief can only exist in your head if that belief actually exists outside of your head it's not a belief anymore it's a fact so belief only exists in here and you can work with that that has its potentials but a fact is a fact whether you believe it or not you see the difference so anyway if someone has mental illness if they're psychologically depressed or psychologically psychotic let's say some forms of psychosis if you can get that person to sit back in their mind raise their consciousness a little and watch their thoughts being psychotic they have this realization that one wow that's just my thoughts i used to think that was me and two 
wow, I didn't realize I had the power to jump out of my thoughts when they weren't behaving themselves and do something about it. Suddenly, if you don't understand these things, when you're in your thought process and your thoughts are being depressed, you think it's you that's depressed. When your sight, when your thoughts are confused, you think it's you that's confused. But if you can step out of them and watch them being confused, suddenly you're not. If you just have this tool in there that's not working quite right at the moment, and you have absolute power and control to step out of there at will. And that's not difficult. That just requires a couple of exercises and you get strong at it very quickly. That's how I deal with mental health. Then from there, you can have, I can have the person change their diet, feed their brain, mental. There's two kinds of, uh, in this respect, there are two kinds of nutrition for mental health. There's the nutrition that we all know about, good food, lots and lots of fruit and vegetables, lots of nutrients, lots of good clean water, and your brain will start to heal itself. And then there's the other side where lots of good input, lots of lovely thoughts, lots of nature, lots of rest, lots of peacefulness listening to the waves on the beach, that is also mental nutrition. If you put all of that together, those two sides, the person starts to heal very quickly. That's how I approach mental health. Yeah, and like also, I would say the ego is somewhat schizophrenic as well. Uh, like, especially oh, yeah. when I start to unglue from my ego, it's like having three televisions on, three different TV shows, all playing at once. Mm -hmm. And so if you're in that and you're focused on that, then most of the time it's insanity. Like, <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> so when you start to like unpack it and unglue and unravel those thought processes, then it starts to come to like a halt. And then you can actually see on people, I mean, I don't know if you've experienced it too, like you can see on people's faces, it's the serenity after they yeah. get out of it. And then they're just like little saints right there. <laughs> but um, yeah. One of the, the what was it? Sorry, one of the exercises that we did in Tibet, uh, I, was, I was training to be what I guess you could call a Tibetan medic, um, which is where I, why I learned the things that I've learned. Now, um, one of the things I was told was that if you've never been, and this, you brought this up, if you've never been insane, you can't really fully help an insane person because to an insane person, insane things are normal. Insane things to an insane person is sanity to them, um, which makes it very difficult for you to use reason and logic to work with insane people. So if you've never experienced insanity yourself, it's very difficult to understand an insane person. So there are breathing techniques, which I went through and exercises, which will make you insane. And I sent myself insane for over 12 months on purpose. I was being watched, I was being taken care of, and then I was brought out of it. Um, it was reverse engineered. There's ways of doing that as well. But once that's finished, you, there's not much about insanity that you don't understand. There is understanding insanity by reading books that were written by people who have observed insane people for many, many years. That's one viewpoint and that's fine. And there's things that can be taken from that, but to actually have been insane yourself means that you've experienced what they are now experiencing. So I know exactly what you're talking about. I've been there under controlled conditions. Yeah, it's not fun. <laughs> it's um, an insane practice. <laughs> yeah. And my last couple of questions here, uh, this is gonna be like my little random questions that I had. So first one is, have you had any uh, divine intervention in your life? All life is a divine intervention. 
Otherwise, you would be dead. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. That's not what you meant, though, is it? Uh, in my head, it's like, has something that seemed like it was other uh, came into your life and prevented a harmful incident from happening to you? Something like that. Only my own mind. There are times whereby... Okay, I'll, I'll try and give an example here. I, I have, I've ridden motorbikes all my life. I have a beautiful Harley Davidson now, which is one of my best friends. But I've had a few motorbike accidents. And when you have a motorcycle accident, it's very fast. You, the bike comes out from under you. And all, you go, you, all you've got time to see is sky road, sky road, sky road, because you go and things are breaking as you're going along. But for some reason, when that happens, something else kicks in. Some survival trait of the higher mind kicks in and you pull yourself out of it. There are times where a car might be racing towards you, not on a motorbike now. And for some reason, something kicks in and you can just jump out of the way of this car. And it's only a few minutes later, you look back on it and you think, how the hell did I get out of that? If you have a belief system, you will call that, you will go, that was a divine intervention. Uh, but it wasn't. It, it's your own mind. You have to give faith in your own mind. There's a part of you that can kick in that you wouldn't believe is there. There's a typical story of the woman who, you know, a 50 kilo woman suddenly can pick a car up off a, off a child, a burning car. She picks it up and bring because there's a baby trapped under there. If she had a belief system, that would be seen as a divine intervention. But it wasn't. It, it, it's in you. It's, it's a superpower that we all have. Um, there's experiments and demonstrations where you can actually bring this out of people. The, the military is very good at bringing this side of someone out when necessary. Mm. Um, I'll give you a for instance of the divine intervention thing. There was, uh, you, you brought up Christianity and please Christians don't, I'm not putting anything down here whatsoever. There was a gentleman, he was quite young and, and naive and he was, I guess what you would call a born again Christian. And he'd had a serious back problem for a long time. He, he could hardly walk. He, it was pretty bad. And one day he, he was so bad he just needed to lay down and there was this horrible dilapidated old couch in the corner of this person's house and he just said i just need to lay here for a few moments so he laid on this couch and we all heard his three vertebrae go clunk 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 which would have happened anyway i i do this on a regular basis <laughs> so i have a bad back immediately he jumped up, he felt fantastic, the pain was gone and he dropped to his knees and started praying and thanking for the divine intervention. Now, of course, you can take anyone with a bad back, if it's that same situation, warm that back up a little, lay them in the correct posture and just give them a little touch on their belly and the vertebrae will all fall into place and it will be very loud. You'll hear this clunk, 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 clunk and it just falls back into place. That's just physics. So divine intervention, it depends how you want to look at it. It really mm. does. Yeah, definitely. Okay. You, do you see what I'm trying to get at? I'm, I'm I see what you're trying to get at. Very, very high, hard here not to trample on people's beliefs. I'm, as a mystic, I, huge believer in science and practicality and not not giving away your own power and your own spirit to belief system. Mm -hmm. And the last question here, have you ever encountered aliens, Sasquatch, ghosts, <laughs> any other ETs? And what are your thoughts on them? Well, you're an alien. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I have had experiences. Let's leave it that way. All right. Lovely. It was nice having you on, Grandmaster Wolf. Love talking to you. Wonderful being here, Ezekiel. Thanks for inviting me again. It was great. I thoroughly <laughs> enjoyed it. Thank you. All right. Have a good rest of your day. You too, buddy. You take care.